And so the first thing I wanna say is, um, and I'll ask this again at the end, but I think as you'll see with the presentation that I put together today, that I would like to be able to share this one publicly. When I have a, a, a sort of default policy for the learning journeys that I share the first webinar, but I don't share the later ones because sometimes during the discussion, personal topics come up because we, we become more open and connected to each other. And so I normally don't share the later ones for that reason, but I would love to ask permission to share this one because I just found that when I put the slides together, I think a lot of people are gonna want to hear this one. And I think I've put together, put together something that, that may be um, uncommon or possibly unique. And that is really valuable in this moment with so much collapse happening around us. So I'd love to just ask that if anyone would rather that I don't publicly share this webinar, please share your feedback in the, in the chat or send me a message. Otherwise, what I'll do is when I, when I post the video later, I'll just put it on YouTube as public. And I'll ask you all again at the end, just in case we go somewhere personal during the discussion. But I'd like to be able to share this one if that's okay. So just if anyone has, has reticence or is concerned about me sharing it publicly, please let me know. Um, today, we're going to be talking about becoming intimate with collapse. And this grew out of the the conversation we had with the host team this week about what we were seeing in the community calls and the way that we saw the depth and the seriousness of the discussions that came out of the exploration of how disruption can make us stronger. And one thing that felt really powerful to explore further was in one part to create deeper clarity conceptually about what collapse is not just what is planetary collapse, but what is any kind of collapse. And so I'm gonna put on my complexity science hat. For those of you who don't know, I'm trained in, in complexity science and was a member of a research center called the Center for Complex Systems Research, the University of Illinois, which was affiliated with the Santa Fe Institute. And so I'm actually a you know card carrying complexity scientist. Um, although there's actually no such thing because complexity science is so, um, so revolutionary in many ways. And one thing I've known since studying complexity more than 20 years ago is that complexity science has been one of my foundations for making sense of the world. And I just don't know how I could have gotten this far without it. I find it to be absolutely essential and I wish more people understood complexity. So part of today's webinar is going to go into some technical aspects of complexity. I, not technical to be technical, but to really show us how we can discern reality even when it's very complex. And so we're gonna be exploring a bit of that today. But then the word intimate is gonna be very important because as you'll see, I'm gonna emphasize what are sometimes seen as almost scientific, academic, or intellectual concepts, and then applying them to very personal matters to show that we live inside these complex patterns and they affect us and we have effects on them as parts of them. And so we're gonna explore what it means to become intimate, which means like think of being intimate with a lover. When you're intimate with a lover, you open yourself up and you become visible to that person and they can see and know things about you. But also you come to care about them, you come to love them, you come to feel their pain when they're in pain and you become interwoven emotionally with the other person as a lover. So becoming intimate with a lover, that same way of thinking is how we're gonna look at collapse. How do we become intimate with collapse? How do we treat collapse like a lover? And I think you'll see by the end of today's webinar why I feel it's so important that we learn how to do that so that we can navigate what's happening around us and within us. And so with that said, I'd love to just start the presentation part so we can just jump right in. And then I'm very curious how you all are gonna feel about this because yet again, I made it up. I've never given this presentation before. It's an amalgamation of some previous presentations together with some new material, but I've never spoken on this topic before. And so I felt somewhat creative this morning as I was putting the slides together. And so I'm very curious how you all are gonna feel about it. So with that said, I'd love to begin the presentation portion. So let's get going. So first thing is, I wanna talk about this image. This image is a real photograph 
of the highway below Bar Echara, where there are regular landslides. Landslides this happen about 20 times per year. And this particular landslide was sent out to the group of parents and teachers for the school that my daughter goes to because the children would ride in a bus on this highway to get to school. And this rock slide occurred close to the time that the bus was taking the kids to school. And so when I talk about becoming intimate with collapse, I want you to imagine those big boulders falling onto the road as the bus is driving to take my daughter to school. I want us to talk about what it means when, in this case, structural collapse of a hillside might have killed my child and other children. Here on the right of this image, there's a drop of about 200 feet straight down. So I think, you know, 70 meters. So if there was a vehicle that had to swerve to miss those rocks and went off the road, it would be disastrous. And so I, this is what I want to explore today is how does collapse happen? And how can we understand collapse? And when collapse happens, when we're inside the process of collapse and it touches things very personal and dear to us, how do we handle that? And how do we prepare for it? That's really the topic of today's webinar. And I wanna remind us of something that we talked about last week when we dis discussed the importance of body connection and self-knowledge for handling disruption and change where I, I made the suggestion that the key to increasing resilience during times of intense change is knowledge of self. And that we know ourselves through our body connection, through daily centering exercises, through finding stillness in ourselves, through wayfinding within and the healing of our traumas, all of which happens by coming to know ourselves. And at the same time, we need to combine this knowledge of self with discernment of truth where trying to figure out what's going on can be very difficult because we find ourselves in complex moments. So trying to discern the truth about where are we with respect to abrupt climate change? See, that's a very complex moment. Trying to discern what's true is really difficult. And so one thing I hope to do today is to share a couple of insights from complexity science that can help us discern the truth of complexity a little bit better and then to connect it back to this inner world of self-knowledge so that we can navigate those sometimes challenging truths. That when we start to see the truths, we navigate the world in a different way. And you'll see how I do that with my daughter and the risk of avalanches for the route that she takes to school. So how do those landslides happen? From that picture I showed you a moment ago. This is a picture I took from the Bio Parque, which is above the town of Barichara that little village in the distance is Barichara. And if you look at the town of Barichara, it's overlooking a cliff. And going down the cliff is a highway. That is the highway where the landslides occur. So I wanna zoom in on that part of this picture. So I'm gonna zoom in now. So zooming into the same photograph, there's Barichara and there's the steep slope going down the cliff. And that's the highway that goes down to the village of Guane. And my daughter goes to a village or goes to a country school that's halfway between the two villages. Now, what I wanna show you is what happened to me the first time I was in the Bio Parque and I looked in this direction because I'm a complexity scientist. I noticed this, there is a consistent slope to the hillside of the cliff. And that that slope is mirrored above and below the road. Now, why did I notice that? I noticed that because of something called self-organized criticality which we're gonna talk about in a moment. And it helped me understand why landslides are guaranteed to occur and where they're gonna happen. And you can see where they're gonna happen. They happen right there. They happen right there because slopes of cliffs are something that are called self-organizing complex adaptive systems. Self-organizing with emergent complexity and their dynamic systems and that the slope that they achieve is what's called a critical point. And I wanna show you how that works. It works like this. There's a really well-known mathematical exploration in complexity science that's called the sand pile model. And the sand pile model works like this. You start dropping grains of sand one at a time and they slowly accumulate. And as they make a pile, the slope starts to increase. The slope on the sides of the mound gets steeper. 
And then as you approach a critical slope angle, avalanches start to occur. And then as you go beyond that critical slope, avalanches increase frequently and the slope decreases. What that means is this, that as you add one grain of sand at a time, you eventually move to a self-organized critical state. Why is it a critical state? Because if you just add one more grain of sand, you might have an avalanche because the slope you've reached is now unstable across the entire length of the slope. And so the emergence of structure for that critical slope happens through dynamic feedbacks. In this case, the dynamic feedback is that the grains of sand stack up on top of each other, but they're being pulled by gravity. And when the edge of the hill becomes too steep, then gravity starts to pull down into the side, causing avalanches. And as the avalanches occur, the, sleep goes, the slope goes from really high to lower until it organizes itself around the critical slope where it stabilizes itself. And what I want you to notice here is that the previous structure, which is the mound of sand with these shallow slopes, that that previous structure collapses and goes away as you add more grains of sand until a new structure arises, which is the critical slope. And the critical slope is how the pile of sand organizes itself to become what is known as self-organized critical. Self-organized critical means the behavior of the pile of sand itself determines what the slope can be as the slope releases parts of the pile by having avalanches and maintaining parts of the pile by being stable enough not to fall. Now, what I want you to notice is that critical slope. Let's go back here. That critical slope is right there in the hillside. So the first time that I looked at this, I saw that critical angle. I saw that someone had cut a wedge into the slope and that the slope would form avalanches because now the slope is gonna to grow too steep just above the road. And so just above the road, guess what? Part of the town of Barichara is now gonna fall down as landslides occur because this highway was built 30 years ago. And for the last 30 years, there has been an increasing occurrence of avalanches at the breaking point which is exactly the same idea as what happens in the sand pile model. So here's the thing. I look at that mathematical insight, and then I ask myself, how do I feel when it is my child who might break down during the collapse? What if I take that sand pile model and look at that critical slope of the hillside below Barichara, and then ask myself, should I let my child ride the bus to school? So notice what I've done here. I've taken a technical understanding from complexity science, applied it to something in the real world, and understood that whoever built that road did not study sand pile models. Because if they had studied sand pile models, they would have known that they created landslide risk on the road by building the road in the first place. And I knew the first time I looked at that road that there were going to be landslides and then only later did people start telling me that they were there and my prediction bore out. It turned out that the scientific training I had was correct. But now I live in the landscape of that sand pile model. Where do I place my daughter knowing the harm she might be in? So this is what I mean by becoming intimate with collapse is that if I know about the dangers inherent in the feedbacks of self-organizing systems, what decisions do I make? How do I feel about it? This is no longer an academic exercise. I'm not playing with a mathematical model on a computer or taking a pile of sand on a table. I'm deciding whether or not my daughter goes to a countryside school. And this is where the study of collapse becomes intimate. It's can I look at my daughter in the eyes and know that I place her at risk because I understand the collapse of hillsides? What happens if I understand other kinds of collapse? How does that work? And so for me, I look at this hillside not as a static object, but I see it as a continually evolving, self-organized dynamic system. Because I've studied geology and what's called geomorphology, which is how land change processes change the shape of land. So I knew about landslides. 
And I had studied self-organizing dynamic systems as a mathematical physicist. So I could take these mathematical concepts and patterns and apply them to the physical structure of the land. And so I could look at that road and see the dynamic. But I see that inside myself. I am the seer of it. I don't see it as an objective analysis. I see it as a felt experience as I relate to that stretch of road where I've ridden on my bike. I've ridden on my bike with my daughter. I've walked parts of that road. And when I walk the road, I'm looking up at the cliff above me and wondering if some of those rocks are gonna fall. And I am inside a self-organized critical system. And the mathematical model becomes real. It becomes part of the world and I'm inside of it. I wanna take a brief detour into thermodynamics and explore this further because I feel like it's so important that we understand how these patterns work and that we have a shared understanding of this. For me, this is absolutely essential for learning how to become intimate with collapse. And I wanna start by talking about something really fundamental to physics, which is that there's a way of measuring how much order or disorder there is in any given situation. And the measure of this has the name entropy. Entropy is sometimes just called the amount of disorder that exists in a system. So here are two examples with balls. The low entropy example is that it's highly ordered. And the high entropy example is that it's sort of spread out and, and sort of random. And one way to think about entropy is to ask yourself, how much information do you have to have to describe all of the system that you see. And you can see that the low entropy example, you could actually condense the in information with a mathematical formula. And you could say, you can use less information to generate everything that exists in a highly ordered crystalline system, like the low entropy picture. But the high entropy picture, you have to describe the position of every single ball and how close or far they are away from each other. Notice in the low entropy case, all of the balls are equidistant. They're all the same distance from each other. So you could define one ball and then give a center to center distance between the balls and then multiply that to say how many balls there are and where they're located. And that's a formula. So entropy is the measure of the amount of information you need to have to describe the structure you see, which is why entropy is connected to information. And while that's confusing sometimes, it makes a lot of sense when we look at pictures like this. But the important thing from physics is that in any time that energy is exchanged in a physical system, entropy can never decrease. It can either stay the same or it can go up. And what that means is we have this thing called irreversibility, that as you create structure going forward in time, you can't undo the structure going backward in time. And here at the bottom, is a picture of a very famous fracture, fractal called the Sierpinski Triangle, where all you do is repeat a very simple mathematical process. You take figure one, and then you cut out an inverted triangle from the main triangle, which gives you figure two. And now you have three smaller triangles that look like figure one, and you repeat the same thing for each of those, pulling out three smaller pieces, and you get figure three. And then you repeat this for every triangle you produce until infinity. And what happens is you end up with a highly um, decentralized system, which ends up removing space and creating an endless line that is flowing and turning throughout the space of the original triangle. And what's interesting is this repetition of creating structure is taking the absence of structure and doing something that creates a new structure. Inside figure one, there's no structure. It's all just black but then you put an inverted triangle in the middle of it and you've created a new structure. And the important thing here is that patterns form in the real world by creating structures in a way that cannot contradict the law of thermodynamics that says entropy can never go down. And that leads to something really important, irreversibility. So if you take this nice crystal goblet for a wine glass and you, use uh, like ultrasound and vibrate really powerfully with sound and shatter it, you've done an irreversible process. You've created a lot of structure. You've taken a crystal, which is highly ordered in the shape of a, of a glass and turned it into a bunch of disorganized fragments and shards of glass. And the thing is you can do the process from left to right, but you cannot do the process from right to left. 
You can't take a shattered crystal goblet and put it back together into its original crystal form because to do that would violate the laws of thermodynamics. It's so improbable that the shards of glass would organize themselves into the original atom by atom crystalline structure that it's called irreversible. And so thermodynamics says that when you create structures like this, you can't go backward in time. And so what I wanna ask you is here with this slime mold that's forming in a Petri dish, does this violate the laws of thermodynamics? And watch how it forms, it'll repeat. Notice how as the slime mold, which is a bunch of single celled organisms, single celled fungi that are linking themselves together, that they form this really intricate structure. And the way that this avoids violating the laws of thermodynamics is that it self organizes itself in a way that the local energy exchanges constrain what kinds of information can happen, what kinds of changes can occur. And you can see that really well with the formation of a snowflake. Notice how the branches grow out from central branches, that where the current branches exist, new branches form. Why is that? It's because water vapor, which is relatively warm, and ice, which is relatively cold, which means the ice is colder water than the water vapor. And then as the water vapor goes from vapor to ice, as it deposits onto the ice crystal, it gives off heat into the air. The water cools and the air heats. And as the air heats, because it's a fluid, it spins and mixes. And as it mixes, it changes the local temperature on the surface of the ice crystal. And so some places are too warm for ice to deposit and some places are colder. And what this means is the existing structure of the ice crystal constrains where the ice crystal can grow later. And that there's this unstructured space, which is the space that hasn't yet created stru structure, that as the structure forms, the interaction between the structured and the not yet structured, here, the mixing of heat in the air as the water vapor cools to form ice deposits to make ice crystals, creates this intricate fractal pattern. And so what matters for us to know here is part of the way that order arises or that order breaks down is by the unstructured and the structured interacting as they unfold in time. So we have to get good at knowing what are the spaces of potential around us and what are the patterns that are forming and what are the patterns that break down that are no longer able to form? Because the collapse is the patterns that break down that are no longer able to form. And often, just like the space around the branches of this ice crystal, they're invisible to us. We have to infer them from the patterns we see. We have to understand the physical processes involved. Here, if you don't understand the change of state of uh, air molecule of water, or I'm sorry, a water molecule in vapor form as it becomes ice, that water vapor is warmer. So when it becomes ice, the air gets warmer and the water gets colder. If you don't understand that physical process, you can't explain how the ice crystal forms. But if you do understand the physical process, then the pattern just makes sense. And you can interpret what is being lost and what is being gained, what is collapsing and what is forming. And you can form an intimate relationship, just like how I saw that slope on the mountain, I knew that avalanches were going to occur because I could see that the shape of the road on the hillside created a gap where the self-organized critical slope would find itself again as rock slides occur. I saw the unstructured pattern of future landslides correcting to the structured pattern of a critical slope. The collapse was the instability that was in the existing structure by understanding the physical process that would cause landslides to form. So becoming intimate with collapse is about learning to see what is going to happen by knowing what can no longer happen. When I saw that cut in the road on the hillside, I knew that the slope above was not stable. And so those rocks were not gonna stay there. And sure enough, every time there's a big rain, some of those rocks fall onto the road. And so I can have this as a hypothesis and test it, and verify it with evidence and confirm that it's true. But by doing that, I'm studying the patterns of collapse. And so this is part of how we become intimate with collapse 
is we learn to understand the processes involved so that we can discern the truth of what's going on. And then we can understand the patterns as they form. And as we understand the patterns, we become a part of them because we can make choices to change what happens in the future. Unlike the water molecules that deposit to make this ice crystal, we are conscious agents who can help select whether or not we send our kids on that school bus or other actions within the systems we find ourselves. So I wanna ask you, going back to the slime mold, to imagine that you are inside the unfolding pattern and ask you, how does it feel to be right here? How does it feel to be inside this emerging network as it's forming its branches and connections? How does it feel to be inside of an emergent pattern? And does it feel the same here? This is what's interesting. In physics, this is called non-locality. Non-locality simply means the local rules of, of interaction are playing out in more than one place. People think this is really confusing, it's actually not. It's that the slime mold you see is actually a huge collection of single-celled organisms, and each of them is forming a relationship to its neighbor. And so the local interactions determine how the structure forms, and the overall pattern is non-local because it's happening everywhere locally at the same time. Every local place, the single-celled organism is making its own decisions. But what that means is how it feels in one place could be very different from how it feels in another place, even though the same pattern is playing out at the global scale. And that means learning to see the global pattern requires learning to see it from more than one place within the system, which means you need other people's eyes. You need other people who see the collapsed patterns and they can help you see the parts you can't see and you can help them see the parts they can't see. And unlike these single-celled fungi, these spores in the slime mold, we have advanced sophisticated communication. Humans can talk. As Pink Floyd once said in their song, Keep Talking, unleashing the human imagination, we learned to talk. That we can be parts of the system in non-local interactions who can communicate local patterns until we discern the global patterns, which is what complexity science has helped us to do. So this continual process of collapse and renewal happens inside the great unfolding of local interactions that are spread out in space and time. But what I want us to realize is that each of us lives inside this circle in the center of this image. Each of us is inside the great unfolding where the not yet structured parts are shaping the continual breakdown and death of the old structures as the process is feeling into potential futures. And the whole system is doing this. And you as an agent within, within it can feel the not yet structured. That's where you feel lost and confused. You can feel into potential futures. Those are dangers and possibilities. And you can feel the continual breakdown and death. That's change as it's occurring that you can't go back to. And there's a continual process of collapse and renewal. And to become intimate with the patterns of emergence is to become intimate with the emerging pattern and to become intimate with the continual breakdown of whatever was there before. You feel what is emerging by feeling how whatever was is breaking down. Feeling how it breaks down tells you what's emerging. And so to feel regeneration into the future is to feel collapse from the past. It's the same feeling. And that's why becoming intimate with collapse is something that I argue is fundamental to earth regeneration. If we can't feel the breakdown and collapse of global civilization, then we can't feel the emergence of regenerative culture. If we can't feel the collapse and breakdown of ecosystems, then we can't feel the ecological restoration of landscapes. They're both the same feeling because the continual breakdown and death of whatever was unstable opens up the potentials of the not yet structured to feel into potential futures. And because we're inside the great unfolding, we can guide with our intentions and actions. We can guide toward potential futures that we want. 
We can guide toward healthy ecosystems. We can guide toward the healing of trauma. We can guide toward stronger community. We can guide toward humans not going extinct by feeling into the continual breakdown and death, shaping the not yet structured into potential futures by becoming conscious agents of the great unfolding. And what I just showed with the physics and thermodynamics of pattern formation is that none of this is hokey woo woo stuff. This is completely real and we can and must learn to do it. But I want you to look at this. This wasn't one of my good days. I was having a really bad day and it felt important for me to capture what did I look like that day. I was sitting in the midst of a, of a personal life collapse. This is a photo that was taken about six months ago. And I took this picture to remind myself what it felt like to be in the midst of that collapse. I was in the late stages of the collapse of my marriage. I was 15 years old at the time, an 18 year long relationship. I was in the middle of a collapse of some relationships that I had to the past and the way that I work and who I collaborate with. I was in the midst of emergence for an ecoversity and for a territorial foundation work that continues to this day in Barichara. And as I became intimate with the collapse inside myself by paying attention to who I am and how I feel as this continually happens, I was awakening to be an agent of regeneration. I was awakening to become an active participant in creating life around me as things break down. But what I want you to know is while I could feel the life growing, at the same time, I could feel what was dying. And so I had to accept the grief and the pain as part of the process to be able to feel the life emerging. And as you can see with this look on my face, it didn't always feel good. And that's just the honest truth. But becoming intimate with the death and dying so that we can feel into the potential futures and knowing ourselves to become better at discerning how our, feels map, our feelings map onto reality is the work of becoming an earth regenerator. It's fundamental to what this learning journey is all about. So what I wanna ask you is what does it feel like to live inside of planetary collapse? You remember in the first webinar that I said in 2015, the four green planetary boundaries were shown to be crossed. In 2021, the two pink ones were crossed. And in 2022, the orange one was crossed, or at least the evidence was gathered sufficient to show it. So we are living inside of a planetary collapse process. What does it feel like to live inside it? What does it feel like to awaken within it? There's a great quote by Stephen Jenkins, Jenkinson that my friend Michael Dowd likes to quote in a lot of his talks, where he says that anyone who awakens to the ecological crisis in these times awakens to a sob. He said, Stephen Jenkinson, who's a hospice worker and a death doula, has a lot of experience with death, and he said it more eloquently than that. But to awaken with a sob is to say, what does it feel like to live inside of planetary collapse? It's to feel the death of the biosphere. That's what it feels like. How do I feel personally about it? That's for me to learn. How do you feel is what you're going to be learning or what you've already learned. But what does it also feel like to live inside of personal collapse, like the breakdown of a marriage or the loss of a loved one, or to just go into a deep depression, or to deal with severe addiction? What does it feel like to live inside of personal collapse? And what can you learn about yourself in those intense moments that can help you navigate planetary collapse? Similarly, what does it feel like to live inside of cultural collapse? This is a photo I took yesterday in Bucaramanga showing an indigenous man with a missionary and a conquistador. And it symbolizes the collapse of the cultures of this place as the colonizer culture came and committed genocide. What does it feel like to live inside of cultural collapse? Where I am here in Colombia, named after a psychopathic serial killer, Cristobal Columbus, the cultural collapse continues because there are still about 100 indigenous cultures that are mostly intact and within the boundaries of the nation state of Colombia. The cultural collapse is ongoing. 
So when I come here and try and regenerate this territory, I enter into an ongoing process of cultural collapse. What does it feel like to live inside of it to try to bring regeneration? How do I relate to the local Campesino culture? How do I relate to the indigenous people? How do I relate to the colonizer cultures, some of whom are my ancestors? I was born into a colonizer culture. How does that work? What does it feel like to live inside of cultural collapse? People in the United States are dealing with the collapse of the US empire. What does it feel like to live inside of it? See, these questions don't just ask us to study collapse. They ask us to place ourselves inside of them and ask how it feels so that we can become active agents using our feelings to navigate forward. And this brings us to the healing power of stillness. You may recall with the image I showed last week that part of how we cultivate knowledge of self is to have body connection and daily centering act activities and to find the stillness within ourselves. There's a great healing power of stillness and I wanna explore this with us for the next few minutes. As we look at planetary collapse, we can see that the state of the world causes pain. If you pay attention to what's going on, you're gonna feel the pain of the world. So a healthy psychological response to pain is to get rid of the cause of pain, which is to be in denial, to shut it out. It's actually psychologically healthy to ignore what's going on. It's not ecologically healthy, but it's psychologically healthy because feeling all of that pain can cause trauma. But what it means is if we shut out the pain of the world, we no longer feel what is happening. And if we no longer feel what is happening, we give up our agency. And that's why we feel powerless. We don't feel powerless because of the pain. We feel powerless because we stop feeling. This is fundamental. So finding the stillness in yourself is about learning how to be comfortable even when there's pain. So what is stillness? I love this quote by Brene Brown. She says, stillness is not about focusing on nothingness. It's about creating an emotional clearing to allow ourselves to feel, think, dream, and question. What does that mean? Creating an emotional clearing. What is an emotional clearing? And how does it allow us to feel, to think, to dream, and to question? You see, when our emotions create a crisis response, we simply react with whatever habits we have. So we need to cultivate the space where we can feel, think, dream, and question to figure out what to do intentionally and consciously, consciously after we felt pain. See, stillness is the ability to be present when new energy arrives and feel it. Notice how as these ripples are spreading, the stones are there and they can feel the ripples crossing. Stillness is the ability to receive information from what's around you because what is around you is moving and you are stationary with respect to it. To feel your stationary place as a centeredness of awareness. Here's an example. This photo was taken in 2013 as I sat grieving the death of a glacier. This is a photo taken in the Canadian Rockies during a bike tour as I was watching the last remnants of a glacier that was nearly gone. The stillness was that I sat in meditation in a rapidly changing landscape and I gave my attention to the history of glaciers on this mountain and the future understanding that there will come a time during my lifetime that there are no more there's no more snow, there are no more glaciers on the Canadian Rockies. And as I sat in that presence, I could feel the death of the glacier. My stillness was the ability to be present to what was happening and to just let myself feel it. And this leads me to what I wanna share. I wanna share my most regenerative practice. My most regenerative practice is my daily stretch routine where I get up at four o'clock in the morning and for 90 minutes, I do a combination of movements, stretching and breathing to connect to my body. And as I do this every day, the emotional turmoil I feel about what just happened the day before and what I need to do during the next 24 hours and the next day, I find a place of stillness in myself to just be present to it. And as I do that every day, I'm able to be intentional 
about which part of emergence I'm going to dance with that day. And this is how I know to go to the Bioparque and pull grass. This is how I know to reach out to someone to start a conversation. This is how I know to create a new crowdfunding campaign and start some new work. This is how I know how to feel who is experiencing trauma and what I might do to help them by connecting into the stillness of my body as a daily centering practice. And that's how I could sit in the midst of a profound changes from that glacier in 2013 to this moment in November of last year when I was going through immense inner turmoil and I could just sit and be present to the power of the music and the flame during this fire ceremony here in Barichara because my body was learning to find the stillness in itself and I could connect to the feeling of stillness by training every single day, by learning how to connect back to it. And by doing this, I could find the place in myself for intentional conscious action. See, the paradigm of stillness works like this. As you cultivate a body connection, you cultivate a grounded calm. That grounded calm is your parasympathetic system. It's your immune system and your nervous system, learning to just calm itself. And as you calm yourself, you start to just feel what is happening without judgment, without reaction, more and more calm, less and less reactionary, more and more capacity to feel what is happening. From this feeling of what is happening, there is a space in which you can cultivate heartfelt action, and receiving of the gift of whatever's happening in the moment. You can appreciate the love and support. You can appreciate the beauty. You can appreciate the time you have with a loved one, whatever it may be, and you can take heartfelt action. This is a photo that was taken back in early April of this year as the Bio Parque was set on fire by an arsonist. Someone intentionally burned part of the Bio Parque. Because of my daily body practice, I was able to calm myself and just become aware of how my fear and pain both were reminders of how much I love the Bioparque. That as Joanna Macy has made famous, the ability to grieve is the capacity to love. And the more I felt the grief of this fire, the more I knew my love for the Bioparque. And what I don't show in this photo, on the next photo, is that it's this place where this fire occurred is where we built the ceremonial site for our solstice ceremony. The solstice ceremony happened in the burn site because those of us who bore witness to this fire and felt our love for the Bio Parque, the fire created a connection of the sacred. And so we built a ceremonial site there to remember. So this ability to, to, um, to appreciate what we love and receive that gift of love and then take heartfelt action I didn't act out of anger or fear or contempt or revenge. I acted out of love to create a ceremonial site with other people in the community because I was acting from a place of stillness. See, it works like this. As you find the grounded calm in yourself, you can just notice how you feel. As you notice how you feel, you can start to accept it and increasingly accept it without judgment, although that takes a lot of work. That's always a work in progress. And then as you begin to accept without judgment, you can start to clarify intentions about what you do, about what you see happening. And only from there can you create actions that are truly intentional. Now, what's amazing is that the realm of stillness is the realm between noticing how you feel without acting and coming to clarity of intentions before acting. It's the space between having an emotion and taking an action. You feel angry. Do you take a deep breath or do you say something angry? You feel scared. Do you calm yourself and explore what you're scared of? Or do you just run away from the fear? You see, this realm of stillness is the place between noticing and acting, which can grow through mindfulness practice. And it's from this realm of stillness that we can become intimate with collapse and act from whatever is breaking down with clarity of intent, instead of reacting with old habits that may not serve us. So my question for you is how do you feel about becoming intimate with collapse? Does it scare you? Does it make you nervous? Does it make you feel curious? Does it give you inspiration and hope? 
Do you feel like maybe there's something you can do that you didn't even realize you could do? Did you realize that what seemed negative could actually be very positive if only you knew how to work with it? The whole realm of ecological anxiety and climate grief is about people not understanding that our intimacy with collapse is the source of our sovereignty and agency to take intentional actions. If only we can find the stillness within. And the more we do that, the better we're going to be. And so it's with that that I'd love to have a discussion with all of you. I'd love to explore this together. Because what I think is gonna be really important here is that we start a dialogue around what it feels like to live inside of collapsed patterns and that we open ourselves up to new capacities to feel and to discern the truth together that we may not be able to find on our own. And I wonder if it's okay if I might go to Janet first and then Brian second only because Brian has asked questions first for each of the previous webinars. Is that okay, Brian? I know how anxious you are and I love it. No, well, yeah, sure. But I, yeah, my question is already in the chat. So we'll, we'll, it doesn't matter what we'll order to me at all. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to, to invite that as, a, as, as just a shift in the field. Janet, please share. And we'll get back to you, Brian, in a moment. Janet, please. Um, I'm really deeply moved. Like every time I come to these webinars, I'm affected by what you share and today more so than ever. So I don't have a question. I just have a huge yes in my whole being to what you've been saying and how I, I'm just so excited about joining with others in this getting intimate with what's collapsing and from there creating what's possible because we're connected. So I would like to read just a, a little bit that I wrote this morning related to what I'm doing in the circles I facilitate. Shaming, blaming, isolating, holding separation from others, being aggressive with others. All of it comes from pain and grief and fear. We are not able to let ourselves feel and don't have a clue what to do about. The world I want to live in is one where we openly acknowledge how vulnerable we all are and we accept and support each other in the fear and grief our vulnerability creates in our lives. I believe we have amazing ability to meet our life experiences and navigate them in a way that is truly supportive to all life. When we find our way back to each other and we meet what life brings us together. This means acknowledging and spending time with fear and grief we have distracted ourselves from, turned away from, denied is there. It means seeing and feeling the patterns of defensive responses each one of us created to survive our environments while we felt isolated and alone. The purpose of the circles I facilitate is to slow down, to hold our emotions together and discover the defenses we have that hold us separate from our emotions and from each other. Oh, wow, Janet, that's so beautiful. I wonder if you might actually share that text in a post to the participants. And of course, if you'd feel comfortable doing that. It's just so beautiful. Yeah. Just, just a big hug. Thank a you. Big hug. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go back to Brian and his question now. Um, Brian, I know that you wrote it in the chat, but would you like to reiterate it? Uh, yeah, we'll second. So what, I'll just read what, what I wrote. I, I absolutely love the practicality of today's topic, Joe, from very recent experience involving considerable complexity in small group work with, within pro-social context. 
often the threat of collapse that disruption poses. In other words, that would be a, a shared sense of collapse among group members as um, the, a disruption to the group's shared relationship, you know, sig signaling a, a problem um, occurs in a way that its root cause, uh, however, isn't readily discernible. Uh, in other words, those, and that can be a shared responsibility among group members for dealing with the disruption may have difficulty determining whether the problem is arising from the bottom up, the top down, or even from the inside out, um, which, you know, that's important because of the integrity, the un underlying trustworthiness of that, that shared uh, ecosystem or com complex adaptive system. So cause causality is, uh, is a very, you know, it's a crucial factor. And uh, so I'm just curious what your your thoughts are kind of along the lines. I, I think so much of the webinar's topic um, is so valid and in in various various ways. So I'm very grateful for the for the content and material that you presented today. I'm curious what your what your thoughts are. Yeah, um, this is so important what you're naming, which is that when we are in a social context with other human beings, we bring all of our previous habits and our coping mechanisms to the ways we interact with other people. And so like if there's a woman who's been abused and she's around a man that reminds her of someone who abused her or whatever it may be, whatever it may be, those things are there inside of us and we bring them but they're usually invisible to the group. And also the group is a fiction in a very important way, which is each of us projects our own idea of what the group is, but those different projections are not the same thing. Which is just to say that human groups are extremely complex and very difficult to discern. And so the best way to discern them effectively is to cultivate a safe space of openness that creates more intimacy and connection between people simply so that they share, proactively share with each other what's going on. So if I'm in a group setting and someone says something that upsets me, if I'm close enough with them and I feel comfortable with them, I let them know. And even better, I let them, in a way, let them know in a way that's kind to them because I know how they would feel if I told them in a different way. And so this sort of self-knowledge and other knowledge and together knowledge that arises through that openness and vulnerability is what the pro-social process does when it's working well, as it does that. And so I think one of the key things is to find the stillness in ourselves. So if we're in a context with several people where we haven't cultivated that capacity among the members of the group, and then problems start to arise, it's actually better to withdraw and ground, not withdraw from the group entirely. You may or may not do that, but just withdraw from the dynamic that's creating this amplification to ground and clarify, which is basically, let me calm myself and go into a mode of noticing and listening. Maybe let me walk away from the group and take a walk and figure things out and then come back. Let me go and talk to some individuals in the group and try and figure things out and then come back to the larger group process, but not simply react. It's creating the space between noticing and reacting, that space in between that matters so much. And because almost everything about consumer capitalist modern globalized culture is about productivity. And almost everything is about trauma responses of basically unhealthy human development in, in a variety of ways. That we're going against a lot of cultural norms to do this. To actually calm into ourselves and feel into how we feel and then come back in a constructive way and to do it on a time scale that's not about the productivity of the purpose of the group. Notice I'm using my finger quotes because one person might have that idea and another person doesn't. So it may not actually be a shared thing of the group. And that's why I'm using quotes. There may be a productivity purpose or it may be that one person has an anxiety about things not getting done and they 
push into the group what a purpose is that they want to achieve, but it actually wasn't co-creating with the other members of the group. And so various things like this can happen where the space becomes more muddled the more it's agitated. Right. And it becomes more clear if we can just find the stillness in ourselves. Well, at least they made right. me try to spot. So just to right, see Joe. So capacity. Kind yeah. of what you were saying then with your in reference to the physics between the unstructured uh, and how, how states um, are related to, and the patterns of states, the sensitivity to pattern states as, as having the potential upon, upon structure, the unstructured um, becoming st structure um, is really, really interesting to, to me. So th thank you so much, I appreciate uh, the presentation today. Thanks. Yeah, no, thank you. And um, let's hear Zebulon, please. Uh, kia ora. Um, yeah, this idea of becoming more intimate with collapse makes me think of um, to die before you die. It's something Eckhart Tolle talks about. I think it's a Buddhist teaching and it's sort of just about uh, you yeah, coming coming to grips with your mortality before the end of your life, and and that can just be a way to release fear. <clears throat> and so, yeah. So, so it's I, I guess I guess that just makes sense to me. Like if you if you release the fear of death, then it can allow you to live your life. So I just think maybe if you become intimate with the collapse, or that. But yeah, that's just going straight to it. You know, it's 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 not that this fear-based thing. And so if it's coming from an intimacy place, it's just a lot more powerful and it's a lot more yeah, centered to the human experience. So yeah, thank thank you for going through this so clearly and also just for this advice of um to sit still with it. I I because I'm like, what what actually what are the actions to become intimate or to die before you die? Like what do you actually do to make that happen and yeah, sitting in stillness. Um, that, I think that's exactly what I wanted to hear. So no question there, but thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you for bringing up that this piece about, sometimes I just call it death primes because that's a term used in anthropology sometimes. The death prime is the psychological priming of death. You know, some, some piece of information that causes you to think about your own death. And there's some really good research on religious behavior or spiritual behavior, or even like atheists who don't believe in spirits or the afterlife will behave pro-socially because someone told them a story of someone who died in the room and it's a priming of death, just getting someone to think about death. And it turns out that death primes can both make us more antisocial and more pro-social depending on how, they're, how, they're play, how they play out. So like being afraid of death might cause you to just try and get everything for yourself and become really narcissistic. Because you, you know, if you don't believe in an afterlife, so that's like an example. Whereas what generally happens with death primes, if there's enough time to process the grief, is that compassion opens up. And we start to just take things for granted less often and to make choices from our hearts more often and not just default to whatever society tells us to do, but do what's meaningful to us. And one thing I found in my experience with people doing regenerative work is, and this has especially been true when we've been raising money for larger projects, is almost all of that larger money has come from people who have deeply accepted collapse and are pretty far along in their own personal grieving process. Basically, they're ready to just ignore the social norms of society. Actually, most of the time, everyone around them doesn't understand them or thinks they're crazy. And notice how there's a fine line between what I just said and actual cult behavior. So the key is that that person has really good self-knowledge. That person has been doing mindfulness practice. That person has been studying the research literature of what's happening to the world. You know, and so they come to a place of deep knowing in themselves and they're ready to accept it. And then the action they take seems crazy to everyone around them, but in a way they know that doing what everyone around them is doing is crazy. Meaning it's disconnected from the reality of the world. 
And so this ability to have confidence in ourselves, which is why earlier in the previous webinar, I started talking about solitude when Brian had asked a question during the discussion, how much we need solitude to know ourselves. You find the stillness when you have solitude. You'll find the stillness if you go out into nature by yourself. Or if you have a newborn child or a toddler, spend time with that pre-linguistic child. Like, it's so cool to, to be in a pre-linguistic space, to be in a non-word space. When my daughter was a year old and I played with her, I just went into that mode, of that body-based mode. It was huge for finding stillness. So, so there are lots of lessons to be gained in this about what finding the stillness can do to heal us and to empower us to make intentional choices. So it's really a big deal. Um, so just, just, I'm just sort of reinforcing is all I'm doing. <laughs> totally agree. I'm curious if there are any other questions or comments that anyone else has that they'd like to share. Mitty, please. Um, I have what I don't know until I say it. Uh, maybe a question, maybe a comment, but what's coming up in me in the moment, Joe, is I think about this whole question of where my personal peace sits in the um, discovery of the patterns is that I may have a feeling that uh, relates to a trauma, a past trauma. Uh, and I think you've spoken really clearly to that. Uh, but I may have a feeling also, which is wrapped around what I hear uh, as being someone else's analysis of what a pattern is and what the key is. Um, and there's something which I'm searching for, and I don't yet know what it is. It's kind of over the rim of my horizon, there's a, there's a piece to be spoken, I feel, around the, the extent to which the importance of the many points of view can help us. Um, and, and sitting, the stillness also being in the contemplation of the perspectives, quite irrespective of the feelings, associated with them, how, how sitting in the stillness of the different perspectives, allowing space and a pause can help us to leap to a new level of awareness about what the pattern is that we're seeking to understand, that it takes us kind of together beyond the, the earlier picture we might have of the pattern because we're only seeing a little piece of it ourselves. I, I think it's around this whole thing of, of Prigogine and I, I'm now going to stall because I have a sense that you have a piece to, and maybe others have a piece to speak to around this discerning of, the, of, of what is the pattern that we're responding to. Your example of the hillside was was beautifully clear. Um, it's these complex human patterns uh, that I'm kind of sitting with. I hope there's something in that, Joe. That <laughs> I'm sure there's something that you will pick up because yeah. <laughs> invariably you can. Well, well, I I want to say two things. One is this is the role of the network weaver you know, the person who has empathy and that weaves themselves among the relationships of others and helps others to weave together. So the person who, who engages the weave of human relationships with conscious intention and compassion. So this would be like the social entrepreneur who goes and talks to people and gets a systemic understanding of, of a context and then probably collaboratively designs a solution together with other people there. Um, so that would be an example of, of like a network weaver is moving through the space to try to understand the various aspects by engaging with the diversity of people who are in a diversity of places within the system. 
And that can be a, a single agent, but they're acting as a tapestry. So that's one lens. And we can explore what that means with lots of examples, but that's one lens. The other lens is co-creative or facilitated group processes. It's like social system mapping. So let's say that, like um, I'll use an example from my book, which is from the work of eco agriculture partners, where they do integrated landscape management, where they try to help an entire community of people to manage the regeneration of their entire landscape. So one thing they do is they gather together different stakeholders, it's a multi-stakeholder process, and they convene them. And as they convene them, they all talk together, what are the problems, where do they come from, who else needs to be at the table, that's all a mapping process. And as they're gathering that information, then they say, okay, what are the key questions? What do you see as the big challenges? And that's also a mapping process. And then they say, okay, so now let's imagine 10 years into the future, what is the best possible future each of us can imagine for this systemic problem we've been coming to understand? Maybe it's water, maybe it's food security, whatever it is. And then they do this dreaming process of the future. And then they say, okay, now what are some different realistic scenarios of the future? And see, and there's this process. And without going any more into detail than that, you can already see that good group facilitation gathers together the collective intelligence through the facilitation process itself. And so the key is that there are two like major like overarching perspectives on this. One is the network weaver, the person who is actually doing the system mapping, like they as the being or the system map acting in the web of relationships they're in, and these social engagement processes that facilitate the emergence of collective knowledge that is collectively shared. And both of these are very important. And actually I'd say for bioregional regeneration, you need both. And you need actually a diversity of each. You need more than one network weaver and more than one social mapping process because the territories are so complex. But you see the idea. So the key is that um, a lot is known about group facilitation and community organizing, and a lot is known about social entrepreneurship and network weaving. And I, when I say a lot is known, I don't mean everyone knows it. I mean, it's there to be learned. And so as we grapple with this and we say, oh, what would be a good process for mapping out the social needs of this space? Then we go and talk to some of our community facilitator friends who are really good at that. I'm just using that as an example as, we also can map out the capacities we have to do mapping. <laughs> and, and that's actually not meta, that's very, very practical. <laughs> like who could actually convene and facilitate this process? Like maybe Mitty, maybe you're a good facilitator, but you're so engaged in the process, you wouldn't be seen as neutral. So you help find another facilitator because you've already mapped the need for that neutrality. You see what I'm getting at? It's like, it's that, and that would be a network reverse awareness. So just, just to show that there is a lot that's known about this and we can definitely keep exploring it. But I think this super organism collective intelligence is a big part of where we're going with this kind of work. But we get there initially by really getting good at sovereignty and discernment of ourselves because that's such a foundation in all of this, especially during stressful times. Um, is, that, is that pretty good for now, Mitty, for me to go on to yeah. Jeffrey or is that good? That's, be that's beautiful. Thank you very much. No, thank you. And Jeffrey, on to you. Thank you. Um, so uh, just as sort of like a juxtaposition to that in terms of knowledge of self, and I think there's something about intimacy um, and the genuineness of the openness of intimacy that does have to do with not knowing. And, and like a big opening to the unknown, um, both in like the large sense and in the smaller sense too, even in terms of the, se the self, like knowledge of self. So I, I think in, even in terms of the, the quietness, the stillness that another language might be in some sense, a wholeness, feeling wholeness. And that like we can't know wholeness, we really can't know it, but in some sense, we actually do have the ability to feel wholeness and that's the connection to the larger sense. So there is something I think about being willing to not, like intimacy involving not knowing 
And I think sometimes what really gets in the way of our intimacy with our loved ones is we actually think we know them and we want to know them and they, they want us to know them. But in some sense, we have to not know them to, to really know them. Mm. So, and then they, I think just, you know, Shane was, was kind enough to sort of say something about this Audrey Lord article, which if it, it's, it's really, I think it's right to the heart of what it is to really feel. And it's called Eros, you know, it's erotic to feel. It's not, we're not talking about like pornography. It's actually the exact opposite. Pornography is sensation, not feeling. And so eroticism is really the ability to feel deeply and it's been actually trained out of us. You know, it's been trained out of us. And, and as males, it's actually, and I think anybody in a patriarchal world, it's actually Audre Lorde, you know, this article is really, really important because it's opening to a deep feminine darkness, you know, a deep, rich, rich darkness. Um, and so knowing isn't necessarily the, the way, you know, feeling is the way. And like every time we kind of don't know, that's okay. So the last piece I want to say in terms of the intimacy with collapse, you know, over as things have felt, it makes so much sense, right? And so as, as like over the last decades, as I've struggled and struggled and so in some sense, the depression, the anxiety, these are the messages of the intimacy of collapse. And I think all of us can start to reframe you know, anxiety and depression and trauma, like really we're talking about generative approach to trauma. We're talking about a traumatic sensibility as opposed, you know, so anyway, I think this is really, really important stuff about the darkness and the richness of uh, unknowing in terms of knowledge of self. And thank you. Uh, super important. So no, thank you. This is such a big deal. I just wanted to share one thing I learned from studying complexity that in a, in a sort of um, in a much smaller way makes the same point that you're making, because the point you're making is in many ways about the embrace of the mystery and the embrace of the unknown, which goes much deeper than what I'm about to say. But I think you'll see how they're very much related, which is that um, the person who taught me most about complexity was a physicist named Alfred Hubler, who was a professor at the University of Illinois. He passed away about two years ago and, and just this sweet, dear, beautiful man. Um, incredibly creative and in the best possible sense, I said, he was always like a super creative four-year-old, just so pure and innocent and beautiful. I mean, it was incredible. And one day he was talking about, like of all things, he was talking about how you measure pressure, like air pressure, like the pressure in a balloon or in a tire. How do you measure pressure? Well, in statistical mechanics, what you do is you just take the average. Say on average, there are this many collisions of this many molecules in this volume of space. And so on average, that's the force that's expressed over surface area. And so that average tells you what the pressure is. Pressure is a statistical measure. It's an average for trillions and trillions of atoms. He said, so what happens if your assumption that it's well mixed, your assumption that the density is the same from one place to another, what happens if that assumption is wrong? Then assuming uniformity creates an error. And he was saying this in the context of studying chaotic systems, systems that exhibit chaos. Systems that exhibit chaos have a pattern, a statistical pattern of clumping. Some things are really close together and some things are really far apart and trying to average it creates huge error. And then he said something that really surprised me because he worked with middle schoolers and taught middle schoolers how to do complexity science. And he said, you actually don't need to know calculus. You just need to know some basic algebra. And I was sort of surprised by that. And then he said, it's because you use difference equations instead of differential equations. So those who don't know, differential equations assume that whatever you're studying is continuous. Whereas difference equations just measure from one moment in time to another and assume complete ignorance of everything that happens between those two moments. So you're like, the state is from point one to point two. So day one to day two, what's the weather? Day two to day three, what's the weather? And you assume total ignorance. You don't assume statistical average. You assume total ignorance. But what he found is in times of rapid big change, the assumption of near total ignorance gives you a better description of the system. 
the more chaotic the system is, the better you are using algebra instead of calculus. The better you are not to assume continuous knowledge. And it turns out ignorance is the finesse and the elegance of studying complexity. Don't over characterize. Don't look too much at the details. Look at the general pattern of stability or instability. Look at the general pattern of the interactions. Look at the general pattern of emergence and don't get caught up in the details because you're over specifying your knowledge and your false positive knowledge is what gets in the way of, no of actually knowing the system. So you see how that little insight about using algebra instead of calculus is sort of a technical scientist way of getting at what you're talking about, about the mystery and the unknown. And it turns out that complexity science grew out of what are called toy models, which is take something ridiculously complex and assume it's so simple that a baby could play with it and use the simplest mathematics you can that just basically captures the behavior of the system. And it turns out that's almost better, almost always better than a more sophisticated model, almost always. And so what that means is you don't have to have a PhD in physics to study complexity. You just have to have a way of tracking patterns and having comfort with not knowing, which opens this world up to everyone. And this guy, Alfred, was so beautiful at teaching sixth graders how to do complexity. He taught them how to create fractals in real life. And I knew people in grad school that didn't understand how to do it. And it was because he embraced the ignorance as beautiful and necessary. Not only beautiful, but necessary. And so just naming the depth and significance of what you're saying, it's, it's so important. And so, um, so I just wanted to name yeah, it. I just and also end with just like the sort of tying it together with like literally the physics in terms of complex adaptive systems, it needs space to emerge. Right. So this is what we're talking about. The darkness is actually the space of emergence. And if we want to control it, that will actually kill the emergence. Right. So you actually in order to allow things to emerge, there has to be darkness and space. Yeah, um, I do. I practice capoeira. And capoeira is an, an exploration of positive and negative space, which is taking up the space or giving the space away. So if someone tries to kick in my head, I just move out of the way and give them the space. And that's because capoeira is developed in the mindset of a slave, because it was slaves from Angola who brought this artwork, this art form to Brazil. And so if you practice capoeira, you practice the elegance of giving up the space until the other person, the attacker, becomes overconfident. When they become overconfident, they make mistakes. And that is the secret subversive power of the slave. The slave's real power is to pretend to be weak when they're strong and let the master overstep their power and become imbalanced. And that's exactly the moment you can sweep them or kick them in the head if you're using the capoeira fighting metaphor. But you can see the same ideas. The complex system will kick you in the head or it'll surprise you. And, and I just, this will be the last I say, but to tie it also, there's this, a theorist has spoken about the like the practice of stillness. Another way to think about it is negative capabilities, negative capacity, right? So the ability to hold the unknown, right? The ability to hold chaos and complexity without knowing, like just be able to hold the chaos in a way that this ability is called the negative capacity. So, or capabilities, negative capabilities. We're just riffing, we're like waxing poetic right now. <laughs> I think it's so beautiful. Um, I, I just love it. Thank you, Jeffrey. I could tell that we should hang out. <laughs> Pamela, I see you just raise your hand. Please jump on in. Well, if you do hang out, I hope I can be a fly on the wall because that was great. That was really uh, interesting to hear as best as I can understand it, not knowing anything about any of that stuff. Um, but I'm wondering then, because I was, I, I was wondering, self-knowledge was kind of like a little, I was getting a bit hooked by um, an uncertainty about the certainty about self-knowledge. And so this conversation has provided so much nuance and, and, uh, to that. And I'm wondering if there is anything, given that you have been speaking in a kind of more what has appeared to be a more concrete way about self-knowledge within this particular webinar and the previous one, if given this conversation and our now collective appreciation of the subtlety, would you 
would you rephrase any of that uh, to incorporate this uh, embrace of not knowing? Um, yeah, just wondering how you would how how you'd say. Oh, that's so beautiful, Pam. Um, what I would say is that knowing your ignorance is a big part of knowing yourself. Knowing what you're inadequate at or incapable of is a big part of knowing yourself. Like if I know, well, for example, and Pam, you know this story maybe better than some of the people who are newer here. In December and January, I went through a deep process of dealing with childhood traumas and came to a place of acceptance that I may never have the love that I needed and finding a way to be okay with it. And then magically, magically, the love I needed appeared because there was someone else who saw complementarity with me after she had come to the same place. And yes, I'm talking about Penny who used to be at my side. Now she's in the other room with Elise. As Penny actually saw me giving up on the search for love as the signal to look closer to see if I was what she had been looking for that she had given up looking for. And so this thing of giving up on knowing, of surrendering to the unknown as a form of self-knowledge. You see, this is sort of like dancing with paradox. It's like what you don't know is what you know, but how do you know you don't know it? Let's be careful not to get too caught up in, in semantics for this because we can really get lost there. But the key is that knowing that you don't know or knowing that you cannot know, like me knowing that I could not know if I'd ever find love. Really important. And this, these levels of nuance are where the most powerful things happen. And so as we sit into collapse processes, like right now I'm raising money for Las Albericas after we'd successfully raised it and then unraised it and then got back to this confusing place because of collapse patterns. And collapse pattern called into question whether we could buy this piece of land that's an anchor to our territorial work in Barley Child. I have to continually update my unknowing. I thought I knew we had it. It turns out I was wrong. Now I know that I don't know. Update. <laughs> update. Refresh the mental model. And that requires a lot of psychological flexibility and compassion for self. Compassion for self is, I'm someone who for a long time only felt valuable because I knew things. I was the smart kid. I was the straight A student. So how do I become the good person because I don't know. You see, I have to unlearn cultural patterns. I had to know that I actually anchored myself to an ego insecurity of being the smart kid for a long time to get over my own ego issues. <laughs> and so, so there are ways this also becomes like a, you know, peeling off the onion, that we know things at one level and then we unknow them at another to know them at a different, but it's all as we grow and change across our lives. So we don't have to know it all at once. That's way too confusing. But in any given moment, there's a tension of what we know and don't know and what we know wrongly, what we think we know, but we're wrong. And we're gradually figuring it out. And, and that's more the way it feels is just clumsily figuring it out. Um, you know, Mitty's comment the other day in a different conversation about a, a jumble of threads and disentangling them sort of comes to mind here. And I see Mitty's raised her hand. So back to you, Mitty. <laughs> Well, what's coming really into relief for me as I listen here now is something around the, the flexibility of agency and surrender. It, it, it's like learning to the dance of both is what I'm hearing. I love Jeffrey's input. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was, that was so beautiful. And I'm also seeing something about space and how we've we've tended to see in in modern thinking we've tended to see life so two dimensionally so we see a triangle and we don't see it as a tetrahedron and the tetrahedron is is the space uh, and i'm going to be quiet now <laughs> thank you well, what's beautiful is in the chat we're getting a couple of really nice comments, especially the one that Shane said, it seems very important to learn to unknow that which we know wrongly. And I would say that unlearning, decolonization, and dancing with emergence, these are all the same process. They're all the same process, they're just different facets. 
And a big part of like when we talk about an ecoversity where unlearning and decolonization are connected, that means we also learn to dance with emergence. We learn to be in these entangled webs as living sentient participants. And the not knowing is how we're open to relating. And so the ability to relate and the ability to not know are deeply connected. They're so deeply connected. So just to honor that. Okay, now back to Pam, and then we probably should wrap, wrap up because this could just stay fun for a long time for those of us who are in it. <laughs> um, yeah, what was occurring to me with uh, Shane's comment about the uh, learning to unknow that which we know wrongly and uh, thinking of willingness, how it's difficult to, if, if, you're not, if one's not able to be open, I don't know if it's openness or willingness, what is the connection between openness, willingness, to be in that state which makes it possible to know that you don't know or that you know wrongly? Like how, like that's not an easy place to be at if what you know is what, if you claim to what you know. Mm. One, I'll just say one thing related to this and then we can all go and take a walk and think about it, which is that an anchor between knowing and not knowing and what to do and what not to do, the anchor is the story we have of ourselves. The anchor is the story we have of ourselves. So in any given moment, I'm this person doing this thing and I'm trying to blah, 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 whatever it is. And we have to be willing to change that story, which means we have to let an identity collapse. We have to hospice and let a sense of self die. And if we cannot learn to love the letting go of part of ourselves, we cannot embrace the unknown as we are emerging. So an example of this, just to make this concrete for a moment, is imagine you've been married for a long time and your partner dies. Now, so much about who you know yourself to be is now broken. So much of who you know yourself to be has another side that no longer exists in the same way. And it begins to break down. And some people cling to it because they don't know how to handle the fear, the anxiety, the unknown, whatever it may be, and it's really, really hard. And that's completely understandable. But there becomes a process eventually where they come to some place of openness and acceptance. And in that place, they realize, wow, I was with that person so long. The person I was when we started is so different from the me that I am now, that now I have to figure out who I am now without this anchor person in my life. But there are two ways to think of it. I have to, like a burden, or I get to, like an adventure. Like, wow, who am I now? What kind of a person might I be? And to get to that place of joy in the journey is to get far enough in the grieving process. To receive the gift of all the love and support that was received from that person, to be able to enjoy being the new me, whoever that is, in this new moment. And notice that the depth of that for a marriage partner or a life partner, the depth and pain and seriousness is how it feels to let civilization die. And so I'm not using that example haphazardly. The depth of decolonization, the depth of change of self story, the story of self is so profound to decolonize ourselves that it's like having a loved one you've been married to for 40 years and they die and now you need to find joy in who you are now? Like you have to bring life to it? You have to be regenerative? Like that's how deep and significant being an earth regenerator is. And that's why all of these topics are so intimate and why being intimate with collapse is also being, being able to love and let go, which is not easy. And this is sort of like advanced Buddhist practice. Um, that's more or less what we're talking about here. And so um, what I'd like to say, and just sort of bringing this to a close for, for right now, because we can continue the conversation in the community calls. And I think it's probably a good place to just sort of let it sink into us, is that what I feel about becoming intimate with collapse is the more I embraced collapse, the more I was able to have innocence and joy in my life. And the more innocence and joy I had in my life, 
the more I've been able to bring life to others. And so paradoxically, by giving up on the doom of planetary collapse is how I embrace the empowerment of regeneration. And it has been so powerful for me that I can't imagine getting anywhere close to this without becoming intimate with collapse. And that's why I see a lot of my friends who are regenerative leaders who are not ready to accept collapse, they're not getting far enough. And that collapse awareness is gonna hit them on the head enough that eventually they're gonna get it. And we're gonna see the changes in them eventually, but we shouldn't wait for them and we shouldn't persuade them, we should just love them. And let them be in their own process because being with collapse is intimate. And it's not my place or your place or anyone's place to tell them how they should be with collapse. We each find our own, just like we each find our own way into being a lover. And the better we're able to be sovereign in that process, the better a lover we can be. And then the better a regenerator of life that we can be. I'm jumping back and forth between those metaphors because they have strong convergence. They're strongly related. I became a lover of the land as my marriage was falling apart. That wasn't accidental. It was analogous. It was the same pattern relationship in two places. And so um, I love to just close by saying, thank you for exploring intimacy of collapse with me. Now I hope you'll explore it a little bit more with you because you are the one that you most need to be intimate with. And then bring that self-knowledge back to your ability to relate and find intimacy with others in this journey. And as, as we each find that, we will come with an authenticity and sovereignty that is so contagious and so powerful that it's beyond what we could have imagined or felt before we did it. And so thank you everyone. I know this is a really advanced topic and I just think it's fundamentally important. And I just want to, um, to thank you all for being here and sticking with this process. And I'm very curious and very excited to see where we go. So thank you, everyone. See you on the community call. See you all soon. <laughs>